Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you here at um, EclipseCon <coughs> Europe 2016. It's my first day here. Um, I came today from Munich. Uh, my name is Alexandru Jekan. I am a Java consultant and author. And um, I, back in 2014, I um, founded a small consulting company in Munich called Rodetech GmbH. And today I'm here in order to talk to you about Project Jigsaw in Java 9. Uh, most of you already know what Project Jigsaw is. It's the new platform system introduced, uh, the new module platform system introduced in Java 9. It has been working, uh, Oracle worked um, for almost eight years um, at Project Jigsaw. It started back in uh, 2008. Uh, and uh, between uh, 2011 and 2014, there has been an exploratory phase, and now here we are in, in, um, in uh, 2016. Uh, Java 9 will be launched in uh, July uh, 2017. There has been a four-month delay. It um, should have um, had been launched in March. But due, due to many design issues and many stuff, it has, it has been again postponed. Uh, first six months, now um, another four months. I would like to set a little bit the expectations in this talk. This is an introduction to, product, uh, to Project Jigsaw. So I, I won't be able to, to touch um, some advanced topics and stuff. It's, um, I will just be able to scratch the surface in 35 minutes. And I will, um, so we will talk about, we will see what plagued uh, Java developers over the last sever several years. We will talk um, about modularity <coughs> and present some general aspects on it. Then we will um, see how the JDK has been modularized. Um, and we will show the new module graph that, ha that um, um, we have now, but we will uh, see only the Java SE modules. Uh, the, the source code of the JDK has also been modularized, and we have a new structure of the JDK and JRE. Uh, the internal APIs have been encapsulated, and then we will uh, show you how you can define a Jigsaw module, what kind of um, modules do you have in Jigsaw, and we will talk about the accessibility changes in Java 9 because the accessibility has, has, been, um, has been modified completely. We will see what implied readability is. We will uh, see what a modular jar, modular jar is and what JMOD files is, are. Uh, we will see how we can package, um, an, um, package code and then we will see the newly module path that has been introduced in order to replace the class path. Then we will compile and run using JDK 9. Um, we will show you the JLink tool which is used in order to build a smaller runtime image. So not to, in order not to have uh, all, the, all the modules. And we will see the enhanced uh, JDEPS tool that can search of JDK internal APIs and show what kind of dependencies do you have in your code. Then we will just scratch, scratch the surface how you can migrate an application to Java 9. There are two possibilities, top uh, down migration and bottom up migration. And you, uh, then I will give some advice of how of how you can prepare uh, for Jigsaw, what you should do in order uh, that your code won't break. Um, and let's start. Let's see what, what actually pla plagued Java developers over the last several years. There are many things, but two, of, two things are very important. First is the big invisible and monolithic JDK, and then is the class path. Regarding JD JDK, you know, uh, it is very hard to install it on small devi devices and it has a low level of maintainability because there are lots of dependencies between classes and if you want to change something then you have to um, go in other places in your source, co source code and also make a lot of changes. Uh, the, the JDK now, now has about um, 60 megabytes 
and you, can, you can't split it because you have a lot of dependencies and it's difficult if, for small devices, for embedded devices, um, to, to make it, uh, to install it and to, to make it uh, work. Due to its complexity, you have there a lot of um, stuff, legacy stuff that uh, you actually don't need or need a little bit like Corba and, and so on. So splitting the, the JDK into modules is one of the most important uh, things and is the purpose of, of the JDK modularization with Jigsaw. Then we have the class path and we know we have a lot of problems regarding class path. Um, class path, you put everything, basically you put everything on the class path and <coughs> you can't say if something is missing or not. Um, then you can have conflicts between different versions of jars. Um, there are popular frameworks that have hundreds of, of jar files on the class path. And um, when a jar is missing, the G JVM breaks the execution at runtime. So uh, you can know it, if something is missing, uh, the application uh, works, and then maybe you, you, will get, you will get a class not found exception. And with Jigsaw, this doesn't happen because you, you can't start the application. It won't compile anymore. Then it's difficult to, uh, using class path, you have to load all the classes from the class path. But, uh, and if you want to search for a class, and uh, this is a cost on performance, but using Jigsaw, you can, uh, you know exactly where the class is, and it's, it's a great performance oh. improval. And in the on the class path, the dependencies between jar files are not fulfilled, uh, which, is, which is also bad. Um, then I will, start with a little bit of the theory, uh, general aspects on modularity. So advantages and properties of modularity. Some of them are maintainability, reusability, high module cohesion, and low module coupling. And I want to talk a little bit of, about uh, this, uh, them, very general. Basically, maintainability, <coughs> it refers to the degree to which a software system is being upgraded, basically, after release. And um, you know, a big monolithic uh, software application is um, difficult to maintain if it has many dependencies inside of its code. And maintainability is ensured by uh, simplicity. How can you improve maintainability? If you provide an interface uh, and provide an interface and not direct uh, a reference to a class. Also, duplicating code decreases the level of maintainability because you have to change code in many places. And the higher the degree of maintainability, the higher the quality of software. Uh, then you have reuse reusability. This, this is the degree to which we can reuse or replace a module. It avoids duplicating code and reduces the number of lines of code and so improves quality of software. It speeds the software development process and increases productivity. So basically modules can be reused because they implement a well-defined interface. Uh, module uh, reusability is also increased by reducing the dependencies between uh, modules and um, for instance when you migrate applications, uh, re reusability is very important because mi migration becomes simpler uh, by being able to reuse software components or modules. Then you have high module cohesion and low module coupling, and this is what you basically want to achieve in context of modularity. Cohesion measures how the elements of a module are residing together, and it can be achieved by reducing the complexity of the module, by reducing the complexity of the, method, of the, of the methods described in the module, and by defining only one predefined scope for the module. Then you have, have low module coupling. Coupling specifies the level of interdependencies between modules. Basically, the interfaces have to hide uh, their implementation. And the resulting modules are independent and can be modified or swept without fearing or breaking other modules or the application. Um, introduction to Project Jigsaw. What is Project Jigsaw? As I told you, it's the new 
uh, modular system introduced in Java 9, which are its goals. There are many goals. Uh, it's to provide a flexible platform, is to improve performance, is to uh, make it easy to develop Java applications and also to improve security, which is uh, an important topic in Java. So these are some of the goals of Project Jigsaw. You have a lot of documentation on the internet, uh, the Jigsaw official OpenJDK website where you find a lot of, lots of stuff. Uh, then you have the specification document, everything that has been Im implemented. You have, um, I selected three mailing lists. There are a lot of mailing lists, but Jigsaw development mailing list is very active. Uh, there, are, there are lots of discussions there, lots of uh, open issues that, that are discussed and lots of in, uh, proposal enhancements. And if you have any propose, uh, uh, proposals to enhance uh, Jigsaw, you can post there uh, your proposals. Then we have the new API for Java 9 standard edition. And uh, we also have the issue summary because there are definitely open issues and open questions and you can also check them. Here is the link to download the JDK 9 uh, with Project Jigsaw. Uh, Project Jigsaw has been merged into um, uh, Java 9 at the beginning of this year. So it's you, if you download JDK 9, you, you already have uh, Project Jigsaw included. Um, now, <coughs> what are... Um, the most important characteristics of Project Jigsaw. It's strong encapsulation, reliable configuration, security, scalability, and performance. So strong encapsulations, uh, strong encapsula encapsulation. It allows a component to declare which of its public types are accessible outside of the module and which are not. And it basically hides modules internals. It hides the inner implementation. Um, and it is achieved in Java 9 using modules. Um, and it's very important, strong encapsulation also makes in Java 9 a reflective, reflective access impossible. So you can't use reflection to get into the internals of, of a class, to access a class. Then we have reliable configuration. This replaces the class path mechanism with a means for program components to declare explicit dependencies upon one another. Uh, it is based on a capacity to declare dependencies between modules, and um, we can now compile, we can now know at compile time if a module is missing or if a dependency is not fulfilled. And dependencies are basically in Java 9 analyzed and enforced at both compile time and runtime. And this, um, this uh, reliable configuration is achieved by the requires clause. We will see in the module declaration you have requires and uh, exports clauses. And I will show you an example. So every module speci specifies what other module it requires. Then um, security, I, I already told you, the JDK internal APIs are hidden. You cannot access anymore. Just a few of them uh, you can access uh, for which you don't have replacements like SunMisk unsafe, but all the other are, are encapsulated and are not accessible. So these are um, mostly the, the, the Sun packages. And uh, this is important to improve security because <coughs> um, this, was the, this was the reason why, why we had some, 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 a, lots of, a lot of security issues in Java before. And even if you use um, this set accessible method, you, all, you can't make um, a class accessible. Scalability and performance, I already talked about performance. You, you don't have to search the entire class path in order to find something you already know, and it's a great uh, performance boost. And degree of scalability, um, the degree of scalability of Java platform is, is uh, increased because you can create smaller and com optimized deployments that help reduce the amount of memory needed on the corresponding running device. So, because these new custom runtime images contains, contain only the module that you need. You don't need to install the entire JDK anymore. So, it's, that's, that's very good. Now let's see how the <coughs> JDK, as, I, as I've told you, have, 
has been modularized. So now you have modules. Uh, it was divided into a set of modules. And if you want to find all the modules that you have, you can run Java list modules. There are now uh, 92 modules. And the platform modules are the modules that are derived after the uh, splitting of the JDK. You, this, these are platform modules. Then you, you can also create your, your uh, own modules if you want. And how, how, how uh, there are two kinds of plat platform modules, standard modules and non-standard modules. Standard are the ones that start with Java and Java X from these packages. And these contain standard APA packages and non-standard APA packages. And they also can depend upon non-standard modules. And the non-standard modules do not export standard APA packages. And that's very important because the source code that depends only upon Java SE modules will depend only upon Java standard SE types. And this ensures portability across <coughs> multiple uh, implementations. Then here you can also put a module, you see list module Java naming, Java naming is a module, and you see everything that it exports, uses, provides, and contains. I will explain what, what, the, what this means. Uh, basically, this is the module declaration. This is the module info.java file that you see here, except the contains clauses. The contains clauses are not included in the module declaration, so it exports. So that packages, Java's naming directory, are exported, are made accessible to outside of the module, but are accessible if the other module reads, um, reads, reads Java naming. And the uses and provides clauses are uh, used um, in context of services. I won't um, talk about services in this presentation. Then this is the new uh, module graph that contains only the Java SE module. So this is how the JDK has been modularized. And at the bottom, you have Java base. This is where you have uh, Java lang string, uh, Java util, everything you have in Java base. And um, you have two kinds. So with, with blue, you see the modules. You have two kinds of lines. The solid ones are, uh, in, uh, represents implied readability. For instance, Java SQL has an implied readability to Java XML. What does it mean? It, mean? it means that if you need Java SQL, in Java SQL you use, let's say, um, let's say logging, okay? You use Java util logging, and if you require Java SQL, it also requires public Java logging, so you don't have to say, I need Java SQL, and I also need Java logging, I, because you can also access the types in the Java logging. Um, and then with dash, with dashed lines, you have the, the modules, um, uh, you have simple readability. You have Java Compact 3, Java Compact 2, Java Compact 1. These are the compact SC profiles. Uh, and these are all aggregator modules. So they, they don't contain code. They just uh, require other modules and export everything. And it's the same Java SCEE and Java SE. And you can see every module requires Java base. And this is implicitly, you don't have to write into module declaration, I require Java base, it will automatically require it for you. Um, Java base had about 66,000 uh, 6, classes, and um, it, it's, uh, it's right at the, at the bottom. So this, this graph, uh, you see, has no cycles, has no cir circular dependencies. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a clean, clean graph. Um, let me show you how, how the JDK source code has been, um, has been changed. So the source code was also reorganized around modules. And even the build system has been changed in order to build modules. So as you see, you have source, and now you have the module name. And uh, this is what's, what's, what's new, the module name, and then you have the 90 modules, uh, uh, Java, dot base, Java dot SQL, and JDK dot. And inside you have, uh, you have code for specific uh, operating systems, and then you have, uh, so that's, it, it's like before, like in Java 8, but you, you have the Java, uh, you have the module name. And, um, you have, you see there the lib directory, 
this is present only in Java base. But um, the, and you have also the native directory. This, this holds uh, C and C++ source files, native classes and procedures. Um, good, let's, um, so this is the source code and we see the new structure of the JDK and J JRE. So this is the old structure that we have. We have a JRE, we have two bin di directories, and you can see what has been splitted, and this is the new structure, structure. So this is how a modular runtime image looks like. So when you build a modular runtime image, it has only three direct directories, bin, conf, and lib, and as you see there, tools.jar and rt.jar have been removed. And this has a great impact on frameworks because a lot of frameworks use these uh, jar files and these frameworks have to be adapted in order to work with Java 9. Um, the bin di directory, the new bin directory, contains command line launchers uh, defined by the modules linked into the image. And you have a conf directory. This contains property files, policy files, and other kinds of files, but everything that is in conf directory can be edited by the developers. And in JDK 8, this was not the case. There were files that could not have been modified. And you have the lib directory. This contains the runtime systems dynamically linked native libraries. Good, let's see what kind of, um, great, this is the encapsulation of the internal API. So as I've told you, the, internals, the internal APIs have been encapsulated in Java 9. Which one? This one, uh, so they made a classification. We have um, critical internal APIs, and um, they saw, okay, how, uh, where are they used? Which is the rate, uh, how, how they are used? And these ones that you see here, SunMisk unsafe, SunMisk signal, they are still accessible, but they are the only ones that are accessible they were put in the module JDK unsupported. But, but everything else is now encapsulated from the, uh, from the internal JDK API. So they cannot be accessed. And this is the cause why uh, the, much of the code and much of the applications will break when you, when you switch to Java 9 because they, they can't access them and you can't, you can't compile the application, you can't start it, you get uh, you, get an, you get an error right at the beginning. So the internal APIs are the ones in the Sun package, but not only. Um, now let's um, see. But there is a solution to break this encapsulation because that would be a nightmare not being able to do this. The errors are a little bit um, in this direction should be. So you have the new option add exports and if I want to make sun.net package in module, in module Java base accessible, I can run add, ex, I can, uh, run add export Java base, name of the module, package, and my uh, module name. And then sun.net will be accessible in, uh, in my module. So this is a way to break encapsulation using the add exports um, command. Then, we, s we start defining modules. So Jigsaw modules is a fundamental new concept in Java 9. Uh, they are basically source files grouped as packages. So you have, this, you have a module, contains packages, contains classes. And what they contain? They contain uh, native source code, configuration files, resource files, and very important, the module info.java file, which is the module descriptor. This is the module declaration, and you will find it in on the um, top level of the root directory. So right at the, you, right at the beginning, you have module info.java file, and then you have the packages according to the package structure. And um, you, this is the module declaration. So this is how you declare a module. Here I declare my module, module and module name. Every module has to have a name. And I can use four types of clauses, requ requires, and requires modules, that means, I will explain in the next slide, but provides and uses are used for services, I won't uh, describe them today. So this is the content of module, module info.java file, and for each module there is one module info.java file. 
the requires. As you can see, my first module requires my second module. So in this case, my first module can access the types from my second modules that are exported. And my second modules exports my first package. So my first package will be accessible in my first module because I read my second modules and second, my second module export these packages. And you also have a, a second kind of export. This is a qualified export where you specify exactly the modules, uh, exactly the modules where you want to export. So here I export my second package only to my third module and my second modules. Uh, so in this case, um, so if you try, let's say, to use, you, you, you have to write requires for, for every, every um, module. You can't use uh, comma separated modules. You can use asterisks. It, it, it won't compile. This is the only place where you can use comma separation using a qualified export. So this is how you, you create this, um, you, you create a definition of a module declaration in Java 9. Um, and by default, if you don't write anything, if, you, if then your module does not require everything, then it, then it cannot be accessed because uh, by default you have strong encapsulation and you, you have to define which kind of packages you want to ex export. If you don't define, define something, then you, you can't access this, um, these packages. Then you have some types of modules. The weak modules have been introduced only in September 2016. Why? Because they, they saw that um, <coughs> there are a lot of frameworks that can reflect over modules internals. Um, and the non-public elements uh, couldn't be accessed with reflection. And that, that's why they, they introduced the weak module notion. This exports all of its packages. So you don't have to write the export clause. And um, so what kind of frameworks? I can think of Guava, I can, I can think of JPA, and so on. But the standard modules, if you don't specify weak, you have strong modules. And these have requires clauses and exports clauses, as I told you before. Um, they, um, you have to specify the export clauses, and you also have an exports private. So if you write exports private, <coughs> you make the public types suitable for reflection, but only if you write exports private. Weak modules, the unnamed modules and automatic modules are exporting <laughs> like using exports private. I will, sh I will tell you lately what, uh, what they mean because we have less time. Uh, then we have automatic modules. What are automatic modules? For instance, you have a jar file and you want to transform it into a module in order to, to be able to use it. So you put it on the module path and it automatically becomes a module and has the same name as the jar file. And automatic modules, they export all of their, all of their packages and also read all the modules. Um, and they can be used especially for third-party code. Um, so it's basically, a, as I told you, a jar file that you, you take and put on the class path and you have an automatic module. Very simple. Uh, then you have observable, observable modules. They represent all the modules from the system. They can be platform modules, library modules, and your own modules. Um, we see what kind of accessibility changes have been done in Java 9. So there, when, in Java 9, when you have public, that doesn't mean that you can access it. Uh, three conditions have to be met. You, uh, the type has to be public, the package has to be exported, and the module has to read the other module. Also, core reflection does not work, which is, uh, which is the reason for so much discussions, discussion and so, so many frameworks that break because you, uh, core reflection does not work by default. And simply setting a public modifier to a type does not mean that access is applied. So that's the, the biggest change in, in Java 9 which, will, uh, which has a great Im impact on anything. Um, then we have implied readability. I've told you about implied readability. You can use, you can write requires transitive. I showed you in the example in the module graph. 
uh, they changed the name. Previous, previously it was called public, now it's transitive. So if you use Java SQL, and you see there Java SQL contains types from Java logging, then if you require Java SQL, SQL because it requires transitive Java logging, you don't have to also write requ uh, require, uh, requires Java SQL, requires Java logging, it's enough to write uh, requires Java SQL. <coughs> then you have the new concept of modular jars. So these are jar files that additionally contain a module info.class file. So that's the only difference to, to normal jar files. They can comprise only one module, it's very important to remember, and can be used on the module path but also on the class path in order to provide backward compatibility. They are built with the jar tool and this is the structure. So you have all the class files and you have also a module info.class uh, generated. So they are called modular jar files. Um, but if you place them on the class path, they act like a normal jar file. And so you can place them on eight or, or seven on the class path and the module info.class file will be ignored. And if you place them on, on, on nine, then module info Java class will be used. Then you have the JMOD files. These are not so important. They are similar to modular jars, but they can contain native code. So they have the extension JMOD and should be used when modular jar files cannot be applied. For instance, because some JDK modules have native code. Uh, they are basically just used to, to build the JDK images. Let's see how you can package, because I told you, you have, uh, the, you have the classes and you want to package them to create a modular jar. And you use the jar tool and you say jar create file, then you specify the, the jar file name that you want to create. And you also have to specify the main class or using the main class option and the output directory. Um, and then you can use the minus p module descriptor in order to list the content of the jar file. So here you have the, here, so this is the way that you can create a modular jar file. Let me show you the new module path. You have class path and in JDK 9 you have the new module path. This is specified using the module path option and the Java compiler uh, uses module path or uh, minus p. Then the module path represents a sequence of directories that contain modules. So you can give a sequence of directories. Here are the modules I specify uh, in my compiler and it, it takes all the modules from there and compile them. And it can be mixed together with class path. So you can compile and say minus p, uh, list of directories, and then minus cp, class path, and uh, you also can specify the, the jar files. Um, Let's see how you can compile. Um, so when you compile, a, a resolution is invoked. You compile and it builds the module graph and sees what kind of modules are needed because you have transitive dependencies. And um, you have, you, you can use, so you use Java C, you specify module path, the module path option, and then a list of directories. Minus D, you specify where should it output. This is a path to the model info.java file. And uh, there is a difference between module path where you find all the modules that are, are already compiled and module source path where you find them, um, the ones that are not compiled. But you can also here compile everything using find name.java and you you compile everything and put it in the output directory. After you have compiled, you want to run it. So you run, you run using the, the module path option and you say java minus p, list of module di directories, minus m, module name, and you also have to specify main class name if you don't use a modular jar. But if it finds a modular jar, then you don't have to speci also specify the main class name because the main class name um, is, is already specified in the modular jar. So you say java minus p, list of module directories, and so you can run your application. You have, now you have the JLink tool. This is used to assemble a set of modules together with their dependencies into a custom runtime image. 
So this is how you use it. You can create a smaller and compact um, custom runtime image by specifying the module path and the add modules option. So this, here you specify which kind of modules do you want in your runtime image, but it will run the, um, um, the um, it will also search for all the modules uh, it will depend. So you, your module has a dependency, you put it in module name, it will search for all its dependencies, and all the mo modules that are found will be put in the runtime image. And this is the way how, how you can have a runtime image uh, smaller and uh, basically, you don't need the entire JDK. Um, you have the JDEPS tool. This is important for, this is already, already in 8, but it has been in, enhanced in 9. When you switch to Java 9, you want to see, w w do I have um, JDK internal APIs? So this is a statical analysis tool, and you say JDEPS minus JDK internals, and here I use, for instance, Guava. And I want to see, uh, does Guava use unsupported JDK APIs? And it finds that it uses SunMisk unsafe. And it um, basically, for, for most of the JDK internal APIs, it suggests replacements. Here is not the case. But this is, this is a very useful tool of how you can uh, find dependencies on JDK internal APIs. Uh, so you can uh, provide replacements for them when you switch to Java 9. Now, migra migration topic, this is, this is a very complex topic. I will try to summarize it. Uh, basically, when you have, a, a, you have some jars, you can uh, use, you can put them on the module path and you have automatic modules. But there is also a way using uh, the JDEPS tool and the gen module info option. So it will generate a module info the Java file for you automatically because it will search what kind of dependencies there are. Um, I don't think that I have time to, um, to explain everything because this is a very complex uh, subject, but it's possible. So there are two ways to migrate, top-down migration and bottom-up bottom -up migration. Um, and um, now let's see how you can prepare for Jigsaw. As I've told you, um, avoid JDK internal APIs in your code. Find a solution to replace them and use JDEPS in order to find them. Then avoid having dependencies on rt.jar or tools.jar because they, they were removed. Then there are six methods that have been removed. So if you, have, if you use them in, in your code, then you, sh sh you should remove them then avoid using the old version string format in your code. This is not part of Jigsaw, but the, the string format has been changed in JDK 9. And if you use java.version, then your application will not work anymore. So try to, <coughs> um, try to do this change. And uh, also check for split packages. Split packages are basically, they occur when multiple loaders define classes for the same package. So a loader cannot delegate to, diff to two different loaders um, for the same package. This is a com complex subject. I won't be able to cover it here, but um, you should be aware of. And there are six modules that are not resolved by default, and here they are listed. And in order to avoid a no class def found error, you sh have to make the modules uh, resolvable by using the option add module. So this is a module. You specify add module module name, and it will search for all the transitive dependencies of that module. Um, then, as a conclusion, uh, Project Jigsaw is one of the biggest changes in the Java platform since it was introduced back in 1995. Uh, it is a very complex subject. I'm really sorry that I can't um, uh, explain all the, the internals of it, but uh, this is due to the lack of time. It addresses a couple of important existing problems in Java, and it changes the way we architect and design software applications using Java 9. Um, and here you have some resources. So uh, you have the JEPs, how um, they specify what has been done in Jigsaw. The JDK has been um, split it into module, then the source code has been um, modified, then you have the modular runtime image, as I told you, where we removed tools.jar, rt.jar, 
uh, we encapsulated most of the internal APIs. They are not more accessible. And we have the uh, JLink, the Java linker, in order to link multiple modules to create a compact runtime image then you, that is basically a Java runtime um, image that you can use it instead of the entire um, J, uh, Java runtime environment. You can also see the uh, source code because um, there's a lot of work uh, being done there. Uh, it's on Jigsaw Jake. And um, basically this is, um, this is all regarding my presentation. So um, I think time is also, okay. <laughs>